All right, pheasant and ham pie. Could be chicken, I don't care. All right, so we're outside of game season, right? So I'm doing this on purpose for all you people out there that think you can only eat game while it's game season. We have things called freezers, and to the best use of game, we can never eat it all in the game season. And all you people out there that don't like shooting and stuff, I'm down with that. I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, I'm not trying to fight your battle or anything. What I know is here, on Knowlesley Estate, everything we shoot, we eat. It's as simple as that. I wouldn't be part of it if it was anything other. And all these other places tell you they do that. They're lying. Not all of them. Actually, no, I don't want to be telling you anymore. A lot of them aren't. We, 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 we really try our hardest to use every single thing. And the only way we can do that is by using frozen pheasant. So, some pheasant during the season. I've taken the breasts off. Use the other meat and I've frozen down some bags. So today, I'm gonna to make your pheasant and ham pies. I've been making food for all staff and people that have been furloughed and I'm selling it around the estate and stuff. And what I've noticed is, chicken and mad chicken. English are mad for a chicken and ham pie. I didn't realize the levity of how much they love a chicken and ham pie. So I thought, you know what? I'm running out of chicken in my freezer, got loads of pheasant. I'm gonna do your pheasant and ham pie. Can't see it gone. Got some ham out of the freezer too, once again. I'm a big fan of the freezer. I'm not, I'm not against it. Now we've got backpack of cheese. This is some beautiful ham. And Gareth cooked this. Some beautiful hams, honey glazed ham. He cooked, cooked up a couple, cut them down into quarters or eighths or whatever they did, froze them. They defrost perfectly fine. So all you people, oh, I don't want frozen, I want fresh. You don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're being an idiot. Because uh, this is the best way of using everything. And if we want to be sustainable and we want to be good for the planet, we need to freeze things. Using everything fresh is a very idyllic world. How's a family going to eat a whole ham? Unless you start talking to your neighbours. No one wants to talk to your neighbours. They're weirdos. Um, you've got to do this. Anyway, start off track a little bit. Pheasant and ham pie. Get amongst it. First thing we're going to do. Brine. We're going to brine it. So, pheasant has a, uh, people often like to tell you that pheasant's a, a little bit um, oh, tough, a bit gamey. It's none of those things. Gamey is just a word that people don't know what they're talking about, so when they talk about game, not much is gamey. It is basically like the most delicious chicken. Look at that beautiful yellow fat. Andy, our gamekeeper, he just does a marvellous job of looking after them. They just, they are happy birds here. They are happy birds. They live on a beautiful estate. Um, so these are just, it's just basically really tasty chicken. It's what chicken should taste like. And we're talking free range, of course it is. Organic, almost. I mean, it's got no certification because we're, we're, we're an estate that's not an organic estate, but I mean, what they're living on, Andy plants some quinoa. These guys eat quinoa or corn from the estate. They're, they're, they're living a good life. Anyway, I digress again. Brining. I brine a lot of my meat, as do a lot of chefs nowadays. We've gone old school, we've gone flip back. What brining does, is uh, inject some salt into it. Uh, well, it's obviously then seasoning, seasoning the meat and also starts to set the proteins a little bit, which helps with cooking. Because basically cooking is all about setting proteins. Something is cooked essentially when its protein is set. So like if you cure something, you can set its protein with salt and stuff like that. It's, it, I won't get into the, 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 the science of it all, but all we want to do is grab in your breast, now the brine. The brine's about 10% brine, so uh, 100, grams of, uh, 100 grams of salt to one litre of water, uh, plus about 50 grams of sugar, so like a bit of sweetness in there, and I've put thyme and garlic. You can put whatever you like in there, really. And I'm just gonna dunk these uh, breasts in there. Well, I'm gonna put them only in here because they're not very large breasts. I'm not gonna give it long. I'm gonna give it, what am I gonna give it? I'm gonna give it 25 minutes, and I'm gonna put all these breasts in. I'm making a lot today for this pie. I'm gonna give it 25 minutes, and then I'll, I'll pat them off, and then I'll trim them up, I'll show you what I'm doing. All right, so while I've still got the, um, the pheasant brining, uh, I've got to chop up the usual suspects. Um, so, onions, where are they? Thumb, that way, that way, there they are. Here they are, no, there they are. Woo! Onions, leeks. I'm gonna chop them up now. The more onions and leeks you can sort of inject into your pies, the tastier it's gonna be. So we're talking, we're gonna cut, cut these up, gonna wash them if there's any dirt in them. Leeks often, just get a bit that's looking a bit rubbish but by the time you peel off these outer layers the inner layers are going to be fine so we'll probably give them a bit of a wash chop them up nice and fine the finer you chop them 
The easy it'll caramelize and turn into nothing, which is what you want, not nothing. It's not gonna just disappear. It's not some sort of conjury. Conjuring? Conjury? Anyway, it's not magic. It's just gonna disappear and turn into all the sugars and the, uh, the complex carbohydrates inside the leeks and the onions are gonna turn into sugar. It's gonna be delicious. It's gonna give a nice little tinge of color to the sauce. So I'm gonna slice up all my onions. Look, I'm gonna do that in fast forward for you so you don't have to go through my entire process. I and mean, then leeks I'm gonna wash and chop up too. So essentially all that's gonna go in these pies, cook off onions, leeks, I'm gonna add some garlic, some thyme. Uh, I'm gonna make a roux out of that. So add some flour and butter into that, make that a bit thick and dry, add some milk. That's gonna make this beautiful sauce. At that point, it's leek and onion sauce. You can do whatever you want with that, make a pie out of that, delicious. Uh, or then fold through the pheasant and the ham. We'll get all to that later. Anyway, let's do a bit of fast forward chopping. Okay, so pheasant has been in brine for 25 minutes. Uh, now we've just got a little bit of trimming. With pheasant, it's got a little bit more sinew, which is um, these little silvery bits here. A little bit more sinew than uh, chicken, so to make it not uh, what people would imagine, it, they say it's tough. It's not, it's because they haven't prepped the meat properly. So I'm gonna chop off a little bit of that as we go. Um, the tenders at the back. They do have a little bit of sinew running through the middle of them, but I'm not too concerned about them. So I'm just gonna chop them in three and they're going in mine. But you see the sinew there, it's just actually come out. So chuck them in a container. Now, this one, the easiest way of doing it, I think, is along the back here. You'll see there's a sinew runs just basically along there. So I'm gonna cut it almost in half. And when you open it up, you can see the sinew there. So if you cut it, that top section has no sinew at all. That's just a beautiful piece of meat. The bottom section does have sinew running through it. So your best bet is to find a bit of sinew. There it is. Push your knife up, take your knife down, you got it. I can also see a bit running through it. This seems, this is a little bit of work. I'm not gonna lie, this is a little bit of work. You take out that sinew, which you can see is sinew running through there. That meat's good. That's no good. So we've got a fair bit out of this one breast. So I'm going to chop that up into manageable pieces. Now you'll see these darker pieces of meat here. That's just blood. It's just a bit of blood from the animal where it's been shot or something like that. So it's fine. So we're dicing up. So out of one breast, that's still how much meat we've got. So lots of meat. You'll see the odd bit of shiny stuff, which might be a bit of a tense, not tendon, a bit of sinew, but nothing crazy. As long as it's not through it, it won't be chewy on the mouth. So right, I'm gonna go through and de-sinew all of this. I'll do one more breast for you quickly, just so you get a, get a gist. Here's the breast, taking that off, the tender. Tender can be cut into three pieces in the box. Down, middle, and across. That piece is all right. That piece is there. Gonna cut that into two. This one. Beautiful. Going in there. Okay, I'm gonna go for all this meat and get back to you. Okay, so pheasant, pheasant and ham pie, back at it. Okay, so I've got my leaves, my onions, as we said, all chopped up, ready to go. Uh, I'm gonna chop up to get a few bit of garlic cloves in there. So I'm making a lot of pie again. So here we go. I'm gonna go, woo. I'm not gonna go that many. Get about 10 garlic cloves. Um, doesn't need garlic in it, as I've spoken about it before, but it is a little bit nicer with it. And it's not, this much garlic's not gonna make it full on. It's not gonna make it like just the most crazy kid garlic you think you've ever seen. It's quite subtle, it sort of just flows through it all. I'm also gonna put some thyme, chop up some thyme there for you too. Um, and that'll go into, but essentially what we're gonna do to start this process is, we're gonna be making a roux. So a roux is when you get butter in a pan and you melt it, then you add flour to it and you cook that out a little bit just to take away the floweriness. And then that's gonna be your thickener. So those two things together essentially melted is a roux if you cook it. It's a beaumonnier if you don't cook it. Uh, even if you don't cook it, it would still thicken something. It just sometimes has a bit more of a flowery taste. So there we go. 
it's a, it's a garlic. And then we add milk, then we add milk into it, and then that sort of thickens up. That's basically your white sauce. So if any of you have made a basic white sauce before, garlic, I'm gonna put that in a separate bowl because I will start the onions off and the leeks off a little bit before the garlic. Um, thyme. Um, I mentioned before, uh, I'm not opposed to, instead of picking every leaf in, as long as you chop really fine, uh, you chop about halfway down this. It's, it, look, this isn't, you're gonna get, bad, I'm gonna get bastardized by Hector's chefs because the stalks aren't great, but if you chop it fine enough, you, you won't matter. And the bottom of this is, a, this is actually a bit rubbish. I'm using old, old thyme, which isn't the greatest. Um, I'm using up some old packets, which are found in the fridge. Um, so I'm just gonna tuck them under. Give that a good chop halfway down. And the bottom half is essentially stalk, but it is, this is a bit wasteful, but for, so normally just chop up your, uh, pick off your leaves of thyme. Don't worry too much, so I've got, here we go, we chopped up thyme. Chopped up thyme, chopped up garlic. Leaves, onions, meat at the stove. Okay, we're at the stove, pan on. All right, then we want two blocks of butter. So this is quite hefty, large, large amounts. You probably won't need this large amount. So I'm not just gonna throw whole blocks of butter in because that will take way too long. I'm just gonna grab a knife and a spoon. All right, so, so again, try and find the world's largest spoon. This is an Anglo spoon. You don't need an Anglo spoon because we're not making Anglo's. Um, get it in there. Two blocks, as I said, uh, get that melting. So we're gonna make the roux, um, but we're gonna make it while the vegetables are in there. So instead of just making a white sauce and tipping all this in there, I'm gonna cut out a few middlemen here um, and get amongst it. So that butter's in there, let, let that melt for a second or two. And once that melts, we'll put in the onions, we'll put in the leeks. And you know what we're gonna put in there, folks? Salt, that's right, salt, you know it. Woo, salt, cool. Melty, melty, here we go. Bit of heat, starting to melt. Gonna get the onions in now, they're gonna do it no harm at all. And the leeks. So, leeks, leeks, onions, and butter, and salt. I mean, that's a marriage made in heaven. Here we go, a bit of salt there, liberal, liberal. There you go, Sam Fowler. Love, loves my liberal salt use. Another shout out, too, actually, at the moment. Young Maury, right? So, young Maury Armstrong in WA. Little kid, looks like an absolute ripper. Uh, cooking with Scott and Nelly, his parents, and sent me a few videos of them cooking together. Do you know what, really like that. You guys want to send me any more videos of you cooking with your kids? I, I, I really enjoy it. It sort of makes me feel like what I'm doing is slightly worthwhile, as opposed to not just the just exercise and vanity, which most people probably feel this is. Anyway, so back to this, anyway. Hey, Maury. Hey. Uh, okay, all right, creepy man behind the pot. All right, so, onions, leeks. I'm gonna keep cooking this. I'm gonna go for sugar on time lapse because it's gonna get a bit sexy as we cook. Okay, so we're back in the, uh, as you can see, they've started to caramelize, it's in my belly. Started to caramelize and, and really wilted down. A bit of colour's caught on the pan every now and again, which is great. It just helps a bit of caramelisation sort of come along. Um, long you go, bits, the more sweetness will come out. But you know what? I like a bit of texture of the leek too. So I'm actually going to leave it just... It, it, this will dissolve into nothing as I've already gone through. Magic. Magic. Um, but let's, let's go from here. So at this point in time, you need to have a few other characters next to you. Milk. There you go. Doesn't have to be semi-skimmed, it's what I've got. Uh, bit of chicken stock powder, very good stuff. Uh, we've got my garlic and my thyme, that's actually going in now. Uh, Should have gone in a minute ago. Uh, I'm gonna finish off with some cream. Um, the cream is just making it extra lavish. Like I mean, people have been going on lately about how good my chicken and, leek pot, chicken and ham pies are. I think it's just because I put cream in at the end, like some sort of weird lavish bastard. All right, so. Let's get that down a bit more today. As the smoke clears. There we go. So it's just cooking away nicely. 
Alrighty, righty. I'm gonna go get some flour. I'll wipe that in there. I'm using plain flour, but you could use gluten-free flour. Uh, but I'm actually gonna put pastry on top too. So I can't see a huge amount of point in me uh, using gluten-free flour at this point in time. So I'm putting just enough flour to sort of coat everything and a little bit more. So it's gonna make, and watch yourself, I'm gonna turn the heat down a bit for a second. You want it to be able to come off the side of the pan. Yeah, you can see inside. See, it's coming off the pan. It's not too floured. Let that cook out for a second. As long as you're watching it like this, you can see I'm gonna turn up the temp again. So, I'm just hoping to cook out that flour, but it's gonna cook out in the sauce if you, when you like sort of simmered it with the milk in it, but it takes a lot longer. So, this is the best time to do it. So you put flour in anything, you wanna cook it out. I mean, that's sometimes when you can tell you've got a really shit chef. You go somewhere and their sauce tastes floury, because they're rubbish. All right, no, no, no. Well, that's true, I don't know why I'm saying no, that's exactly what's happened. All right, so, let that cook for a bit longer, undo my milks, get myself prepared. Um, and that's about a half a cup of milk I put in, very small amount, and that just gets soaked up instantly, and it's like you were never there. All right. And this is a really good tackers to do. Tackers. Uh, Stephen Owen, are you? Uh, really good tackers to do, just so it doesn't get lumpy. So a little bit at a time. I mean, the best thing about cooking it with all these veggies, I actually find it makes it less lumpy than if you actually make, because there's so many things for it to, to bind to and be abrasive and, you know, agitate. So a little bit more milk, as you can see that time, but still just working it, making sure it's all incorporated before you add the next lot. Kind of like when you're making a risotto, I suppose, and you're adding your hot stock and it's just, going that way so there we go all incorporated go again keep going you'll be able to start adding more and more milk as you go along because it will uh, it will take more um, so that's nearly that's two liters in there I reiterate I'm making enough pie for about a hundred people. So you're just gonna have to take what I do as a, as a vibe again. If you want a particular recipe for a particular amount of people, feel free to message me. I might answer you back, I might not. If I like you, I'll answer you back. If I don't, I'll pretend I haven't seen it for ages. And then in a month's time, I'll go, I'm really sorry, I missed your thing. Hopefully you found something in the meantime. That's how I roll, okay? So it's looking good but that's gonna thicken. So if it's not thick now, it's just gonna thicken more and more and more because it hasn't even started to do its love yet. So I'm gonna go some more milk. I'm gonna go this entire other. So we're going four liters, four liters of milk just to kick off with. And see, as you can see now, I can add this one really easy. It's gonna be no lumps forming because I've already got um, a nice mixture for it to add to. There we go. Stirring it up. Okay. This. I'm gonna add a little bit of ch chicken stock powder. This is halal chicken stock powder, so my halal, keeping it real. Quite a bit of that, really good flavoring stuff actually. I, I'm, I'm not against stock powders and stock cubes. There's a lot of chefs out there which are like, you know, not the right thing to do. Um, I like them. I mean, I don't use them when I'm doing like an exquisite evening or something I'm doing for a very fancy dinner. I'll try my very hardest not to use a chicken stock powder, but I don't usually have a call for that. But as soon as you're making anything like a, a nice pie or a soup or something, oh, I think, I think there's, a, there's a good use for it. I'm just using this whisk a little bit because I've just stupidly just whacked that powder in and it's gone a little bit clumpy on me. So, get rid of them. All right, I'm gonna put this back on time-lapse so you can uh, watch it thicken over time. Okay, you can see the sauce is starting to thicken up now, and you know that by pulling that out, see if it holds itself on the spoon a little bit, so like that. 
run your finger down, you can still see the mark on there. You're laughing once again. Pull that down, you can still see the mark for a second or two. Now, you could have sped this whole process up by actually warming up your milk before you add it to your roux and your sauce will kind of thicken up straight away. I've got heaps of stuff on today, so I've been doing this in between about five other things, so it's fine for me. Uh, now, any sauce with onions and leeks in and any of the onion family will keep thickening. It has a sort of a natural thickening agent in it. Um, so this is pretty good where it's at now. I'm gonna add a little bit of cream to this. Uh, and then we're sort of gonna take it off the heat. Let me just open up the cream. Boom, 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 boom. Damn, we could have opened up the cream before I started filming, couldn't I? Here we go. I'm just going to add, I'm only adding half of that, so I'm adding half a litre of cream. That's just going to give it that little bit of decadence, a little bit of richness. It might take a little bit more later on when we add the meat, but we'll, we'll have a look. So, I'm going to turn the heat off this now. And this is a beautiful sauce. There you go, beautiful sauce all by itself. Um, you could just put this with some potatoes and make it into a pie. This is a great sauce right now for a bit of fish or something like that. It really is delicious. Um, so get that and I'll come back to you. I'm going to go cook some meat now. Okay, we're into cooking of the pheasant. So I'm going to cook my pheasant in a sous vide, so in a water bath. Um, maybe not, I mean, a lot of you might have a sous vide. I'm not, I'm not, obviously sales of sous vide to go through the roof. So someone out there has a sous vide and if you do, this is the best way of cooking pheasant, I must admit. So, I've grind the pheasant. <coughs> I have chopped up the pheasant. I've bagged up the pheasant in the backpack machine, taking all the air out. Then I'm gonna cook it at 60 degrees for one hour. Um, that's not gonna completely cook it. It's gonna give it just enough so that then when I put it through the sauce, when it gets baked in a pie, it's still there. You gotta think about all these things. If you've got completely cooked pheasant, whack it in the sauce, whack it in the oven, bake it again, no, no, it's not going to work. Maybe fine meat or something with a bit more things in, but this is breast meat, so we can't. So I'm going to go 60 degrees for 60 minutes. And this circulator does that. And while we're here and talking about meat and cooking off meat, these guys, right? Stockpot Kitchen. Right. If you're anywhere near Lismore, get down and see these peeps. This is in Australia, in the hinterlands. Um, they do an amazing job. They're just incredible. Best guys ever. Jen and Graham, go see them, the whole family. They do amazing meat. Don't have they sous vide, they're more of a smoker. Love it. Anyway, hello peeps. Um, so, all we do for this is, time is set for an hour, it's going in there. So the thing about sous vide is, if you're quick, let's not sous vide. I won't bore you too much. When we went through setting of proteins, and we talked about brine and cooking it, so basically we can set the proteins and cook things a lot more. 60 degrees is what temperature protein gets set at. So if we cook any less than 60 degrees, it's not gonna set the proteins, okay? So I could cook an egg in here, so an egg's basically, think of an egg as full of protein. Could cook an egg in here for about two days at 40 degrees, not gonna do much. Well, actually it will, because residual heat will start building up and it'll cook, but my point is there, 60 degrees what's cooks it. So anything less than that's gonna be runny. Anything over that's gonna be hard. So we'll use that same theory on here. So this is gonna to start to slowly set the proteins without going too far. Oh Jesus, hang on. Wayward soldier, I need a bit of water out of that because I've put way too much in. Here we go. Probably all I need out. Um, in she goes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so that's in there for an hour now. Uh, and that will just set the protein. And then once it, once it comes out, I'll rip it out of the bag, I'll drain off the little bit of blood that might be in there, and I'm gonna whack it in my sauce with the ham, which I'm about to uh, pick with you. But anyway, you haven't got a sous vide machine, it's a big one, it's a circulator. You can get smaller ones for home. I've got a little one at home that the guys bought me for a wedding gift. Thank you very much. Uh, and they're very, very handy. Uh, they're a nice, clean, easy way to cook, because you can cook meat like in this and then freeze the bag by icing it and putting it down. A really good tech is anyway. Cool, why do I keep saying tech is? Anyway. Let's go do some ham. So I've got the hams, the hams which I took out of the freezer. Um, it's got this lovely bit of skin down the back. Not really gonna put that in the um, in the pie. Uh, if I was eating it for myself, I'd probably put it in the pie, but I'm doing it for a lot of other people and a lot of people might be freaked out by it. So just peel the skin off. Uh, and then what we're hoping to do with this, a lot of the ham, if it's nice enough, you could just flake it with your hands. There you go, just flake it with your hands. I don't mind bigger chunks in there. I mean, you don't want that in the middle of your pie, but everywhere in between there, like all these pieces are fine. It's just kind of 
quite exciting when you get a big chunk of ham. Bits of fat in there. If they come straight off, they can go away, but I don't mind a bit in there either. Right? And if you find that your ham does get a little bit fibrous and hard, so we can, you can just, uh, that's the, just the way too much fat there. You can chop it up, but instantly you'll see, I'll show you what it looks like when it's chopped up. It just looks a bit engineered. It looks a bit, as opposed to flaked up ham, it looks, looks so delicious. So, preferably, you don't want bits like that, which just look perfectly cut. You want like flakes, so you can, sometimes a bit of both of them. So flake it up. I'm gonna go through all of this, flake it all up, and then we'll come back with a whole bunch of ham. Boop. Okay, so I'm making my pies with no pastry bottom. I'm putting them inside these containers and putting pastry over the top because I'm uh, giving these out to people that can't leave their house for isolation and stuff. So these are, well, pie solation, as we like to call them. Anyway, so you need to find, um, so I'm just gonna put puff pastry on top. You could line something with short crust pastry. Um, easy recipe for that. Talking 500 grams of sugar, 250 grams of butter, one egg, a little bit of water. Bring that together in a mixer or by hand. Uh, and then roll it out and that's a nice short crust for the bottom. Um, I'm not, I'm just gonna put the mixture in this or you could put your mixture in an earthenware dish, a metal dish, something like this and just put pastry on top. So I need pastry lids for these. So I found a container that's the same size, an old salt tub. Uh, and I'm just gonna roll these out. I'm actually making 19, so I'm just gonna, I'll do a couple just to show you. Well, I, won't show, I won't make you stay with me for the whole 19 of them. All right, so I buy puff pastry, and it's one of the only pastries I actually still do buy. Because um, it's a bit of a ball ache to make, uh, and the products you buy in are so good. Um, here you go. So when you roll your stuff out at home, it's hard with circles to get um, the right amount. So I've got my circles, and then in between each one, in the middle of each one, I need to, I've lost my little cutter. Here it is, I've got like a little cutter. It's gonna dot a little hole out the middle of each one. Doesn't have to be anywhere in particular. That's just going to sort of let the steam out when they bake. So then I've got them, put them in a tray ready to finish later on. So that's already five. Now, all the pastry you got left here, uh, let me just cut that off the roll so we can have a look. On one side, you've got these bits here. These are lovely. So, I, you, easiest thing to do, trim them up, the scraps you can't do. These bits, though, grab a piece like that, pull it out a little bit thinner, grab a piece of bacon, wrap it along the thing, and twist it up. Egg wash it, bake it in the oven. You got a little bacon and cheese twists. So I'm just gonna put that to one side. I'm gonna make some bacon and cheese twists in a while, but it's a completely separate project. Okay, and there we go. I'll come back to you. Okay, I'm gonna start putting all the components together. The pheasant has been cooked, so I'm just gonna open this up at the bags. So what I forgot to do was go through, if you don't have a sous vide, what can you do? Uh, you can just pan fry this meat all off um, in a pan, as you do with pan frying meat. Uh, you can see this here. It's still got a bit of pink in it, it's still got a bit of cook to go, but not really. It's, it's all, it's, it's set as far as not wobbly or anything like that, but it's not overcooked and it's not chewy and rubbish already. So this is great. And because I strained it yesterday, there's not a whole bunch of juice coming out of this. Um, but yeah, so you don't have a sous vide, just pan fry this all off. Don't coat it in any flour or anything like that, like your grandma used to do, no need for that. We've already made a flour sauce. That was often when you were gonna then make your, your pie sauce around your meat, which we're not. Um, so, rip them all open. This step was literally not needed because there's no juices come off these at all because we've set them, set them all in the uh, sous vide. But it's good to just break it all up. Um, so there we go. Um, what I am going to do is, and this is a good thing to do, is instead of adding all my meat to the sauce, just in case I haven't got the right amount and quantities, and I try and get all my chefs to do this, is um, I'm going to add that into there. So the meat in there. Come and get this down so you can actually see what's in there a little bit more. There we go. Got the ham. So the ham's been shredded. Really nice. That's going in there too. Put that to one side. And we've got the sauce here. So instead of just tipping all the meat in the sauce, we're going to just go the other way around. It's not, not, not rocket science, but this way, we'll definitely have enough. So I'm not going to put all the sauce in. There we go, a spoon. Give that a good mix. So this way, well we went the other way, you, you just don't know where you're at and you might just have way too much sauce and then your pies are gonna be a bit bit saucy and not meaty enough. 
So, as it is, that's going to take a little bit more. So, I left just a little bit in the pot so have a look where we're at. And this can be a little bit saucier than you want to finish because it's going to bake in the oven. So, a little bit of that sauce is going to get sucked up into the pastry. Uh, it's going to be all like that. It's just looking fan dabby dozy, is what that's looking. Okay, cool. You can check seasoning, but remember you've already brined the pheasants, that's gonna have a bit of seasoning through it and already be quite good, so don't worry too much about that. And the ham's always gonna have a little bit of saltiness, as is as in with most sort of cured meats or like anything like that. So I'm gonna taste. Tasting really good. Show you what, I'm gonna get all that sauce in there. And that's just because um, you know, over 25 years of cooking, I generally get my sauce quantities right even though I haven't measured anything so beautiful pot of sauce uh, and meaty ready to go I'm gonna go start filling my cases and then put pastry on I'll probably do all that in time lapse because it'll be boring as hell all right Okay, so I've egg washed all the things too. I just use a straight egg yolk in mine. You can use eggs mixed with milk, I don't like that. Never have, just straight egg yolks. Use your egg whites for meringues, whack them in your hair, whatever you want to do, don't care. Um, so here we go, we've got the pies like this and these are gonna be frozen. So I put my little lids on, like this. Got a date on them and these will freeze, come out of the freezer, 20 minutes in a 180 oven. All right, I'm gonna cook one off for lunch, I'll let you have a look at it and we'll see how it goes. Perfect. Okay, so this is it. Straight out the oven, 180 degrees. 20 minutes. And just look at that inside there. Just goodness. Pheasant, leeks, pastry. Oh, how can this be bad? They're probably gonna burn the absolute bejesus out of my mouth. Let's have a go. Tell you what. Some good stuff. All right, happy Easter.